Turn with me, if you will, please, to 2 Peter, chapter 3. This will be one of the passages to which reference will be made in the opening up of the scriptures this morning. 2 Peter, chapter 3. And I shall read in your hearing the first 13 verses. This is now, beloved, the second epistle that I write unto you, And in both of them I stir up your sincere mind by putting you in remembrance that you should remember the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets and the commandment of the Lord and Savior through your apostles, knowing this first, that in the last days mockers shall come with mockery, walking after their own lusts and saying, Where is the promise of his coming? For from the day that the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. For this they willfully forget, that there were heavens from of old and an earth compacted out of water and amidst water by the word of God, by which means the world that then was, being overflowed with water, perished. But the heavens that are now and the earth by the same word have been stored up for fire, being reserved against the day of judgment and destruction of ungodly men. But forget not this one thing, beloved, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but is long suffering to you, word, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief, in which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall be dissolved with fervent heat, and the earth and the works that are therein shall be burned up. Seeing that these things are thus all to be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in all holy living and godliness, looking for and earnestly desiring the coming of the day of God, by reason of which the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved and the elements shall melt with fervent heat? But according to his promise, We look for new heavens and a new earth wherein dwells righteousness. The apostles were commanded to preach the realities of the death and the resurrection of the Lord Jesus and the remission of sins offered to sinners in the light of that accomplished redemptive work of the Lord Jesus Christ. However, we have seen in our study of Acts chapter 1, in particularly verses 9 to 11, that these same apostles beheld their risen Lord ascend up into heaven, and they heard the united voice of the two heavenly messengers, this same Jesus, who is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as you beheld him going into heaven. And the first thing that we did in seeking then to establish the fact that the doctrine of the Lord's return was foundational in apostolic ministry is to go to six passages in the New Testament which each one independently and together collectively make it abundantly clear that eagerly awaiting and loving the return of Christ was a vital element of normal New Testament Christian experience. As that experience was molded and shaped by apostolic ministry, As surely as Christ crucified and risen from the dead was an essential element in faith and shaping Christian experience, so likewise the fact that the one who died and rose would come again physically, visibly, 
in power and in glory at the end of the age was such a dominant note in their ministry that when we pull back, as it were, the surface of the belief system and the experience and the whole ethos of apostolic churches, we find that this conviction of the second coming of the Lord Jesus was vital. It was an essential part of their faith system and their Christian lives were shaped and molded by this eager awaiting and loving the return of the Lord Jesus. Well, having established from those six texts that conviction concerning the return of Christ in glory and power was an essential part of normal New Testament Christian experience, I then sought to answer the question, why, why do true believers who are in a healthy spiritual state, why do they eagerly await and love the return of the Lord Jesus? And I submitted to you that in my understanding of the scriptures, there were at least four parts in the answer to that question. True believers who are in a healthy spiritual state, eagerly await and love the return of Christ because they long to experience and to see the completed salvation to which they and the whole creation have been predestined. Secondly, because they long to experience and to see the ultimate defeat of all of the enemies of Christ and of his church. Thirdly, because they long to see the public and universal acknowledgement of the true identity and the official position of our Lord Jesus Christ. And fourthly, because they long to see and to be with the object of their faith and love. Now, in the course of preaching these things in five sermons, we've examined many passages dealing with the return of our Lord and the things that will take place at his return. However, before moving on to several messages to highlight the many ways in which the truth of the second coming, I don't use the word the doctrine of the second coming, though it is a doctrine, but it is the truth and the reality of the second coming brings to bear upon Christians motivational pressure. And if we look at the whole Christian life as a circle, we can demonstrate that from the hub of that circle, going out in spokes, touching every place in that circle, the reality of Christ's return exerts motivational pressure upon the whole circle of Christian life and experience according to the New Testament. One respected commentator has said, it is the most dominant reality in motivating the people of God. I will not go that far. I believe the cross is the most dominant, but I'd be prepared to say this takes a close second. That he died for me and rose again is central. That he is coming again in power and in glory is second only to the great truth that he loved me and gave himself for me so that even when I remember him in the way of his appointment, As oft as I eat the bread and drink the cup, I declare the Lord's death, what? Till he come. Cross and crown and clouds are joined together in the thought concentration even of the Lord's table. As to the event of the second coming, It is certain to occur. That's the first issue that we want to address. As to the event of the second coming, it is certain to occur. Secondly, as to the place of the second coming in the history of redemption, it is central and climactic. As to the precise time of the second coming, for us, it is imminent, indefinite, and unknowable. As to the results of the second coming, they are manifold and clearly revealed. First of all, then, as to the event of the second coming, it is certain to occur. When I was a little boy back in the dark ages, and I don't know where it originated, I can remember some of the men in my circle of interaction and acquaintance when they would greet one another 
They would say, hi, John. Hi, Harry. What do you know for sure? Instead of saying, what's up? How are you doing? Or some of the current common greetings. I don't know where it came from. But there's something very attractive about that. You see someone say, hey, Harry, what do you know for sure? And Harry or John or Pete would respond. Well, if someone should resurrect that form of greeting and come to you as a Christian and say, well, Jim, what do you know for sure? Well, Pete, what do you know for sure? Well, John, what do you know for sure? We ought to be able to instinctively respond. I know for sure that my Lord Jesus Christ is coming again. And unless we are prepared to consign ourselves to the murky, poisonous mists of agnosticism or plunge ourselves into the black hole of nihilism by rejecting the witness of scripture and that's all you have if you reject the witness of scripture the murky poisonous mists of agnosticism or the deep dark black hole of nihilism in which you'll say the only thing we can know for sure is that for sure we can know nothing. But by God's grace, determined that we'll not go either into those mists or that black hole, there are some things we can know for certain. And one of them is that the Lord Jesus Christ, who is presently seated at the right hand of the majesty on high, will return physically visibly in power and in great glory at the end of the age. Now the affirmations of this are manifold and consistent throughout the entire corpus of the New Testament. We began the series by noting those words of the two angelic visitors to the eleven as Jesus ascended into heaven. This same Jesus shall come. That's the certainty of his coming. And then the paradigm or the manner of his coming. He shall so come in like manner as you have seen him go into heaven. But I want us to do a quick survey of a number of passages very quickly to demonstrate that our Lord Jesus Christ himself bore witness to the fact that he would return again. And as we said and sang in our hymn during the offering, no longer to come as a babe, to suffer and to die, but to come in glory and power. And Jesus was conscious that that was an aspect in his own history that yet lay before him. And then we'll look at several of the words of the beloved Apostle John. And then several of the words of the Apostle Peter. And then several of the words of the Apostle Paul. And then point in the words of James and Jude. And then just mention by way of a broad overview the entire book of the Revelation. The words of our Lord Jesus himself. Now remember when we read these words. We are reading the words of him who said I am the way the truth. The one who said I do not speak my own words. I speak the words given to me by my father. Mark chapter 13. This is the chapter in which Mark records what we commonly call the Olivet Discourse. That is our Lord's teaching in response to the question of the disciples after Jesus had spoken of the dismantling of the temple. And in their minds they associated that with the end of the Jewish system of things which surely would be the end of the age. So they ask a question, when are these things going to come to pass and what will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age. Well, in that setting, our Lord Jesus, in Mark 13 and verse 26, we're breaking right into the midst of this chapter in which the destruction of Jerusalem and the coming again of the Lord Jesus at the end of the age are matters that at times are so closely interwoven that it's difficult to separate them and sort them out. But in this text, it is clear what our Lord is speaking about. Verse 26, and then they shall see the Son of Man coming in clouds with great power and glory. And then shall he send forth the angels and shall gather together his elect from the four winds from the uttermost part of the earth to the uttermost part of heaven. 
Here Jesus, using that designation that he most frequently uses concerning himself, Son of Man, that messianic figure spoken of particularly in the book of Daniel, that one who receives a kingdom from the glorious and enthroned God, Jesus says, they shall see the Son of Man coming in clouds with great power and glory. That is, he will come in the unveiled expression and majesty of his identity in terms of his messianic function and his person as God. He comes enveloped in the Shekinah because he is the Shekinah of God. We beheld his glory, glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Similarly, in Matthew 25, Matthew chapter 25, after the Olivet Discourse is recorded by Matthew, then there is the record of some very searching parables that we will consider when we get into the area of how the second coming is to motivate the people of God. Now look at verse 31 of Matthew 25. But when, not if, but when, the Son of Man shall come in his glory and all the angels with him. Then shall he sit on the throne of his glory and before him shall be gathered all the nations. When the Son of Man shall come. Our Lord speaks of it in no uncertain terms. He speaks of his own person, Son of Man. He speaks of himself as coming in glory with the entourage of the angels of heaven that result then in his sitting upon a throne of his glory. A throne that will be the manifestation and the outshining of his identity as the God-man. And his proper position as the messianic king. Now about to be the arbiter of the eternal destinies. Of those who are identified in this passage as the sheep and as the goats. And then in John 14. These familiar words so often comforting God's people in seasons of great distress. The disciples were greatly distressed. The Lord has told them he's going to die. And that he's going to leave them. And their hearts are disturbed and troubled. And our Lord says, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions, many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you. For I go to prepare a place for you. And he did go. We've read of his going this morning with hands upraised in priestly blessing. He's received up into heaven. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I come again and will receive you unto myself that where I am, there you may be also. If I go, and he did, and prepare a place, and he is, I come again. Simple, unadorned, no mystical, figurative, apocalyptic vision or language. I come again. Incarnate truth speaks. I will come again. And then in Mark chapter 14, a most in interesting incident in which Jesus affirms the fact of his coming in power and in glory. He's standing now before his accusers and the high priest. And we read in verse 60 of Mark chapter 14. And the high priest stood up in the midst and asked Jesus, saying, Do you answer nothing? What is it which these witness against you? But he held his peace and answered nothing. Again, the high priest asked him and said, Are you the Christ? Are you Messiah? Are you prepared to say that your real identity is that of the long-promised messianic king? The question, the first prong of it is his official identity. Are you the Christ? Now notice, the son of the blessed. This has to do with his essential identity as God the son. For you'll remember, in his interaction with the Jews... 
When he claimed to have God as his father in a unique way, they understood it was a claim to deity. And on several occasions, they took up stones to stone him. And when the question is asked, for what evil deed do you stone me? The answer is, for no evil deed, but for blasphemy. That you, being a man, make yourself God. And the high priest was fully aware of those claims of Jesus. And so he says to him, are you Messiah? That has to do with his official position. The son of the blessed. That is, do you make claim to being a sharer in the divine essence? Son of God in that unique way. And Jesus said, I am. He doesn't say, I am to the first prong. I am not to the second. I am not to the first. I am. No, I am. You've rightly identified my official position. I am the messianic king. I am Messiah. I am son of the blessed. And then notice how he follows up that response. And you... You high priest who sit in judgment of me, you shall see the Son of Man takes that favorite term for himself. People say Christ never claimed to be God. Ridiculous. Look at the context. Son of Man is none other than Messiah, Son of the Blessed. And you shall see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of power and coming with the clouds of heaven. In the full integrity of my position as Messiah that I am and as son of the blessed that I am, I will come again with the clouds of heaven. Verse 63, and the high priest rent his clothes and said, what further need have we of witnesses? You have heard the blasphemy. What do you think? The high priest regards Jesus claims to his true identity in his official position as Messiah, in his essence as son of the blessed, and in the culminating expression of who he is as Messiah, what he is as son of God, and they say blasphemy, put him to death. And we read that some began to spit on him, to cover his face, to buffet him and say to him, prophesy. And the officers received him with the blows of their hands. It is right to say it was Jesus' affirmation of his commitment to come again in his full messianic identity and function as son of the blessed that was the final straw for which he was taken out and brutally murdered.